Hello, my name is Donald Hoffman, and I'm very happy to be here at the Fifth International Vatican Conference virtually. I'll talk about a new theory of consciousness. If you have a stroke in your left hemisphere that takes out area V4 of your left hemisphere, you will lose all color experience in the right visual field. It will look like shades of gray, whereas the left visual field, you'll still see color. And we can also use a magnet to do that. If we put a magnet on V4, uh, it will and, and inhibit, then you will lose all color in the right visual world. We have lots of correlations between neural activity and conscious experiences. This is just one. And the problem of consciousness has been to try to understand how to explain these correlations. Most of us uh, in, in the field have been physicalists. We've assumed that space, time, and matter are fundamental. The Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. There was no life. There was no consciousness. Life and consciousness emerged much later. And the standard scientific approach is to try to understand how inanimate matter and fields could somehow give rise to life and then also to consciousness. So in that spirit, most of the work on consciousness has been trying to start with brain activity and coming up with theories about how brain activity could give rise to conscious experiences. And there are a number of, of, of brilliant theories that, that have been proposed, uh, and many of my colleagues that are brilliant that are working on this. But what's remarkable is, despite all the efforts and, and the brilliant work, we are not yet able to start with brain activity or physical activity more generally and explain even one specific conscious experience, like the taste of chocolate or the taste of potatoes or the smell of a rose or the, you know, the sound of a, a you know, saxophone. So there's no theory, no scientific theory that can start with brain activity and explain how precisely that brain activity must be the taste of chocolate. And it could not be the taste of vanilla uh, and, and so forth. So we're in a position where uh, it's mysterious. We've been looking at this problem for, for many decades intensely, but we've known about it for centuries. And so that's why we call this the hard problem of consciousness. It's hard because brilliant people are working on it and we have no clue how to even get one specific conscious experience explained. So my approach is to look at things a little bit differently, to let go of the physicalist assumption for, for these reasons. It turns out that from on evolutionary grounds, it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that the probability is zero that any of our senses, in fact, any of the senses of any organism, tell it any true facts about objective reality. Now, that's a remarkable claim, but it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that none of our senses tell us any true facts about the structure of objective reality. Instead, uh, what our senses give us for, on an evolutionary point of view is a user interface, almost like a virtual reality. And so space time is just our virtual reality headset and physical objects are like the icons in our headset. And from an evolutionary point of view, this is just there to guide adaptive action. Let us play the game of life uh, in a way that allows us to survive, but not to show us the truth. In fact, evolution specifically hides the truth because we don't need it. And also from physics, we find that physicists are, are coming to the same conclusion that space-time is not fundamental, that as they would say, space-time is doomed. And they're looking for deeper structures beyond space-time, things like the amplitudehedron, um, sociohedron and cosmological polytopes. They're finding structures beyond space-time that don't have the notions of space and time at all, and in, which give rise to space-time as an emergent structure. So space-time is not fundamental, it's emergent. And this is remarkable because space-time has been the foundation for scientific endeavors for and scientific inquiries for four centuries since, say, Galileo. And so what's remarkable is what we're finding is that the framework that was the key framework for all of science for, for the last four centuries, now our best theories are telling us we need a new and deeper framework. There's something beyond space time. And, and so there is where I'm going with a new theory of consciousness. Instead of trying to start with space, time, and matter, uh, I'm not going to start there because our best scientific theories tell us not to start there. They're telling us that space, time, and its contents are not the fundamental nature of reality. Something, by the way, that, that spiritual traditions, including Christianity, have, have said for, for millennia.
But now science is actually getting theories which, which agree and say that that's exactly the case. But now the question is, what theory shall we propose beyond space-time? And so to solve this hard problem of consciousness, of explaining the correlations between neural activity and our specific conscious experiences, again, like the taste of chocolate or the smell of vanilla, I, I want to propose that consciousness is fundamental. And working with a number of, of collaborators, we've proposed a mathematical model of consciousness in which mathematics is used to say precisely what we mean by consciousness. A technical term we use is a conscious agent. And the idea is that reality is a network of interacting conscious agents. So it's not space time, but it's a network of interacting conscious agents. Think like the Twitterverse. There's tens of millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets. It's a really complicated social network. And that's what we're, we're proposing is that reality is a vast complicated social network. And just like in the Twitterverse, you couldn't possibly read all the tweets or interact with all the users. If you want to understand the Twitterverse, you need a visualization tool, something that lets you dumb down the complexity of the Twitterverse so that you can understand it. It gives you simple eye candy, you know, colored objects that are moving in certain ways. And that's what space, time, and physical objects are. They're, they're not the fundamental reality. They're merely a virtual reality headset a visualization tool that some conscious agents use as a, a way to interact in, a, in an intelligible way with the whole network of conscious agents. So we've mistaken our headset for the final nature of reality. It's, it's a rookie mistake. It's like someone who's been in a VR headset since birth, not knowing that there's a reality beyond the headset. And science has really been just the study pretty much for the last four centuries of our space-time headset. And we've uh, done very, very well at understanding the structure of that headset. It's, it's been impressive. We've sharpened the mathematical tools, the empirical tools, and now science is ready to go where the spiritual traditions have said we need to go, which is for theories beyond space-time. So we have the mathematical tools, we have the empirical tools, and so that's the spirit in which I'm proposing this theory of conscious agents is trying to make precise the idea that consciousness is fundamental, mathematically precise, so that we can then make uh, mathematically precise mappings from the network of conscious agents into space time. That way, once we have that mathematical mapping, we can then reverse engineer space time. We can actually ask, when I see something like neural activity in the brain, what does that really correspond to? in this network of conscious agents that's beyond space time. So we should be able ultimately to show how the network of conscious agents maps into space time, reverse engineer space time, and then be able to play with the very structure of space time itself. So space time is not an absolute fundamental reality. It's merely a data structure that we use. And once we understand the data structure, we can re-engineer it and play with it. And so, so this is going to open up all sorts of new possibilities. It, some implications of this theory are that the distinction we make between living and non-living is not a fundamental distinction. It's an artifact of our interface. Our interface necessarily is trying to simplify things. And when I, you know, when I look at a human face, I get a lot of information about the consciousness of the person I'm interacting with. When I look at a cat, my interface is giving me less information about the consciousness that I'm interacting with. When I you know, see a rat or a mouse, uh, even less. And when I see a bacterium, uh, even less. And when I look at a rock, I have no insight from my interface about the nature of the consciousness that I'm interacting with. No surprise, that's what interfaces are for. They're there to simplify things and dumb things down. So I will get some interactions, some interface icons that give me insight into consciousness, others that don't. And so the distinction between living and non-living that we think is fundamental is not fundamental. It's merely an artifact of our user interface format. So, so once again, the idea is this, our best scientific theories are telling us now, namely evolution by natural selection, um, quantum field theory and Einstein's gravity, all are telling us that space-time is doomed. We need a deeper structure beyond space-time. And I'm proposing a mathematical model of networks of conscious agents beyond space-time as the fundamental reality. And we're working on a mathematical mapping from that network of conscious agents into space-time 
that can then give back our current scientific theories as projections of that deeper theory. And then we'll understand how consciousness, not space-time, is fundamental. Thank you very much.